Well, thank you very much for this nice introduction and this comment we have here. <laughs> and I would also thank you very much for inviting me to come here. When I heard about this, I was actually going to spend the whole summer with the family. Uh, but when Sergio was celebrating, I said, I really have to go here. And Sergio and I have shared uh, interest in history in control lately. So therefore, I think it might be appropriate to talk about Harry Nyquist, as we say in Sweden, or Harry Nyquist. Uh, because he was born in Sweden, and he certainly made a lot of contributions to our field. So he had a remarkable career. He was born 1889 in a small village outside Sweden. He spent six years in school. And uh, uh, his father was a farmer, and he wasn't very interested in farming, but he was very smart in school. So he had a dream. He wanted to become a school teacher. And if you lived at that time in the Sweden, if you were son of a small farmer, there was no chance at all to get an education. You had to be a son of a priest or, you know, a high person in the administration. So his teacher told him, you have to go west, so go to California. So first of all, he worked as a farmhand to get some money, and then he immigrated to the United States. He worked as a farmhand, and then he started a teacher's college. Uh, and then he became a teacher, but they noticed some talent with him. So he was pulled back into university. So he studied at the University of North Dakota. And then he did a PhD in physics at Yale University. And then he started to work at Bell Labs. And from 1954, he was a consultant. You know. So it's indeed a remarkable career for a person who was born in this house. And uh, here is his family. So here is Harry when he was about uh, six, seven years old. That's his father, and that is his uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, he wanted to come, become a teacher, as I said. So he immigrated in 1907. And then he uh, was practicing teacher for a while. He went back to school to get the right to a higher teaching degree. Uh, and then he made an exam with very good degrees. And he became a high school teacher for a while. So here is his diploma when he became a high school teacher. But I was pulled for an academia. So he went to the University of North Dakota in 1914, and he got an MS in electrical engineering. And he was very active in student organization. And he met a man, another Swede named Johnson, who we'll come back to later. And then his teachers in, in, encouraged him to, to go to uh, Yale. So he went to Yale, and they did a, a PhD thesis on the stark effect in helium and neon, which was largely experimental. And then he joined Bell Labs. So he had made a career at Bell Labs. He started there in the engineering department in 1917, and then he quickly went to the research department. And um, uh, he was heavily involved in projects during the Second World War, and he became the assistant director for system study, and then retired in 54, and then he did consulting. And one of the things I really regret is that um, he was still alive when I became professor in London in 65. But I was too busy with things. I didn't have a chance you know, to looking up and visiting, which I really should have done. Bell Lab is an, was an unusual research laboratory. It was started for monopolistic reasons. It stated in writing that AT&T said, in order to keep the monopoly on the telephones, we have to control the, the flow of inventions. And therefore, we have to control all the patents. We have to call all, control all the intellectual property. And for that reason, they started a research laboratory. And the research laboratory that was started for such capitalistic reasons had really been, been amazing. They controlled the key technologies. And it was a very creative research environment. They were tremendously successful. They got eight Nobel Prizes. Uh, and there were 14 researchers involved. They get eight. I triple E medals of honors, and they got three Turing Awards. And I may have missed some one here, because it's hard to keep track of the old one. They did radio astronomy. They did solid state physics, the transistor, for example. They did Unix and C, and they did statistical quality control. And of course, they made major contributions to control and communications. So Nyquist, he really thrived in this environment. He had very challenging problems. He had very clever colleagues and very interesting works. And he started off by tackling problems of telegraphy with powerful methods and a lot of insight. And here's what somebody said of him. Nyquist was a much better mathematician than most men who tackled the problems of telegraphy. And he has remained a clear, original, and philosophical thinker concerning communications. I'll come back to the details later. So 
major contributions uh, was he started off by, by working on telegraphy and fax, but I'm going to work, emphasize his work on thermal noise. And the Nyquist frequency, which had to do with um, uh, communication. And then he also worked on long distance telephony and TV, and of course, electronic amplifiers. And I will, of course, talk about the stability criteria, which all of us are using regularly. And then he was involved in a lot of military projects, including cryptography. He had um, 128 patents. Uh, he got many awards. Uh, he got the Stuart Ballantyne Award. He got the IEEE Medal of Honor in 1960. He got the Melvin Kelly Award. He got the IEEE Founders Medal. And also he got the Rufus Oldenburger Medal for, from Association of Mechanical Engineers. So he was very highly recognized. So that was a little bit of introduction. And now let me talk about Johnson Nyquist no noise. And Johnson was this friend he met at the University of North Dakota. So, and what happened was that uh, they were following each other from the University of North Dakota, and Johnson was also before him at Yale. Uh, and thermal noise is found everywhere in electric systems. And you know, if you pass a current through a resistor, you get noise, you get fluctuations. And Johnson, he was making very precise measurement of this, and he found that the, it was proportional to temperature. So if linearly proportional, if you increase temperature, you get more noise. Uh, it was also proportional to the bandwidth of the sensor. Uh, and um, of course, this is of fundamental limitations in all precision measurements, and particularly nowadays in MEMS system, where you see a lot of this. So Johnson developed the theory for that, and it's a very nice formula. Uh, he, did, uh, he did experiments, and then he found that the power of noise in the thermal resistor, four multiplied by the resistance, multiplied by Boltzmann's coefficients, multiplied by the absolute temperature, and multiplied by the bandwidth. It's a very, very simple formula. And it's an example of what in theoretical physics is called the fluctuation dissipation theory. Whenever you have dissipation of something, you always get fluctuations. Uh, so this is one of the earliest examples of this. And uh, what Nyquist wanted to do was to say, can I explain the... Uh, so Johnson had found proportional to R, proportional to temperature, proportional to bandwidth. And Nyquist as I said, can I explain the coefficient of proportionality? And what he did, he did a bit of analysis. He connected a resistor here to a, a telegraph line. Uh, and then in the telegraph, and then he, he was matching the impedances. And then he was looking at the energy of the, the telegraph line, and he made analysis out of this. And then he came up with this formula. And um, uh, there are two papers. They're all published in physical reviews. The first one by Johnson. And then th this is a 12-page a paper. And then there are Nyquist who wrote a three-page paper. So this was the exper experiments. And here was Nyquist's result of this. And this is typical for Nyquist. He didn't write very long papers. But they're very short and very much to the point. And here's what Johnson said about this. I discussed my rights with Nyquist, who in a matter of a month or so came up with a famous formula for the effect based on essentially the thermodynamics of a telephone line and covering almost all one needs to know about thermal noise. So, you know, that's a pretty good contribution. And here's a physicist at uh, Bell Labs who has said the following thing about Nyquist. He's fusing a concept from two quite different fields, statistical mechanics and electrical engineering, points out what has been a particular strength of Bell Labs' work in theoretical physics, the diversity of expertise along the theoretical staff and the propensity of many of them to shift their attention from one area to another, transferring useful concepts in the process. A very good recipe for research. Then we come to the next problem. Uh, the, uh, when should I finish? Quarter two, okay, no problem. So I'll talk about the Nyquist frequency. I think we started a little bit there. So the question was how fast can you communicate? And at that time they were doing Morse telegraphy. So you know, they were sending out signals like this. And then they discovered that when you have underwater communication lines, the pulses, you didn't get two distinct pulses, they got blurred like this. So Nyquist was very intrigued by this, and they said, how, how should we go about to solve the problem? And then Nyquist said, you shouldn't send out these square pulses. What you should do is that you should try to find a useful pulse form, 
which happened to be something looking like a sync function. Of course, he could not use the very beginning of it because then it would never get done. But something like a sync function. And then you should try to find this. You should try to find the optimal shape of this. You should try to find the coefficient. And this is what you said send out. And then you should decode it. So you shape the pulse shape before sending out and reshape them later. And you also answer the question of what the pulse shape was. And of course, this is something that we're still using in ADSL in, in all the communications. And also in connection of doing this, he came up with a question of, um, if we are going to transmit an analog signal digitally, how fast can we sample? And, uh, and he discovered this idea that this signal here and this straight line here, they are identical if you sample at this frequency in here. And um, so he said, you have to sample at least faster than this, which is the Nyquist frequency, which is twice the frequency of the signal. And uh, his work was later uh, uh, completed by Shannon and Kotelnikov, you know, who did the, uh, the, uh, the theorem. And of course, for, uh, this is important for us in control. And whenever we're doing digital control, think about Nyquist and don't ever forget the pre-filter in the digital controllers. And again, papers. Certain factors affecting telegraph speed. Uh, this was a longer paper. It was a 22 paper. And he was also a long one. So uh, there were two papers published about this, which was essentially covering the key ideas. And there was a time separation of this. This was a preliminary one. And this is a more detailed one where it's elaborating on the shape of the function. And then we come to the stability criterion. And um, of course, what they discovered at Bell Labs is that Black invented the uh, amplifier with negative feedback. And uh, well, of course, when they closed the feedback loop, they got oscillation. They call it singing at the time. So they had to deal with the singing problem. And um, Nyquist came up with a totally new way. What they did before was to write down characteristic equations and then analyze the eigenvalues of that. And then Nyquist said, well, let's do like this. Let's send in a sine wave here and look to see what's coming back here. And it's coming back here with less amplitude. It seemed reasonable that it would be stable. But then they had systems with what they call conditional stability, where actually stability got improved when you increase the gain. And that you know, didn't match the simple picture at all. So then Nyquist developed his theory. And he put the critical point at plus 1 instead of minus 1. And then Bode changed it to minus 1 instead. But Nyquist put the critical point into plus 1 instead. And it's interesting now, the people in Cambridge who are doing feedback system, they also put the critical point at plus one, which is interesting. Again, the papers. Here is the paper on regeneration theory. And again, it's about a 21 page paper, not a very long one. And it's re easily accessible. It's reprinted in a nice book by Bellman and Kaleba about mathematical trends and control theory. And it's reprinted in a book that Tamir Bassar headed here for IEEE. It's called 25 Seminal Papers in Control. Here is a comment by, uh, at the time, ASEA, but ABB or Nyquist. ASEA had a control group in Sweden which was extremely powerful. And they really became the masters of uh, frequency response. And um, I invited the, the chief engineers to learn. And here's a talk given in 1970 by one of their real control gurus. And you can read it said. At that time, you know, Nyquist published his paper in 1934. And here is, uh, and a, you're talking about ABB around 1945, 1950. So here it said, we are designed controllers by making simplified models, applying intuition and analyzing stability by solving the characteristic equation. At that time, solving the characteristic equation with a mechanical calculator was an ordeal. If the system was unstable, we were at a loss. We didn't know how to modify the control to make the system. The Nyquist theorem was a revolution for us. So they discovered Nyquist, here, the industry discovered you know, the Nyquist theorems uh, you know, many, many years later. And they say, but drawing the Nyquist curve, we got very effective ways to design the system because we know the frequency range that was critical. We got a feed good way for how the controller should be modified. So it had you know, a major impact. And it had similar impacts in other industries. And here's a copy of um, uh, some material from ABB. For example, they were going to do depth control system of a submarine. Now, you know, it's very hard for electrical engineers to model fluid dynamics. So what did they do? Well, they put in a sinusoidal perturbation of the rudder. They measured the pressure, which gave the depth, and they measured the angle. And they did this by doing 
uh, approximations of uh, the sine wave like this because they needed you know, slow sine waves. And then this was the Navy. So they had you know, a lieutenant calling out 50 degrees, 15 degrees. And then they had uh, sailors changing the rudder and reading off the angles and the depth. So here's a nice measurement they got. And they got the frequency responses. But if it, the ship starts to move faster, you see in here what's happening is that the, there's a superimposed low frequency oscillation. So the submarine was going you know, to the surface and down to the depth again. So the sailors didn't like this ABB people very much. And then they came up with a very, very clever idea of doing modified Nyquist design. They plotted the Nyquist curve from rudder to the angle and from rudder to the depth. And then they were combining various pieces of this to do multivariable control. And they came up with a pretty nice controller of this. Uh, so what they did is that they, in, they developed a culture of, um, uh, they were like cowboys, you know. They, they went out and did this wild sinusoidal perturbation experiment. For example, to experiment on the Swedish power network, they took a power station that had about 500 megawatt. And then they were changing this in a sinusoidal way from all the zero power to full power to get the um, frequency response of the power net. And um, this tradition of uh, bravely going out and doing experiment was something that I knew about. So when we started to work in the pulp and paper industry, we tried to do the same thing with system identification. Said we can't model. And of course, sine wave was out of the picture because they were too slow. So we had, let's put in perturbation and let's not be scared about it. And of course, there was a lot of skepticism in industry doing that. Uh, so we persuaded them that we should do a small test experiment where we perturbed for about 15 minutes. And they put all their best quality control people. And they didn't know whether we were doing experiments or not. And then, you know, it was free for us to go on doing the experiments. So this was actually a great inspiration for us. So now coming back to Nyquist. I had this introduction about the farm boy who had to go to the United States to get an, ex an education. And then he did a fantastic career at Bell Labs. He did the theory for, Nyquist, uh, for thermal noise. And now, now it's called Johnson Nyquist noise. Johnson for the experiment and Nyquist for the theory, which was an early example of the dissipation fluctuation theorem. Then I spoke about the Nyquist frequency which we use all the time in sample data systems. And then I spoke about the stability criterion. So now let me summarize a little bit. And I think one can learn a lot to see what the old masters have done. So he certainly had talent, creativity, and curiosity. He was also very energetic, and he worked very hard. So he was like Frank Algerver, <laughs> who you'll hear later. <laughs> and, and also, he had an ability to find good and stimulating environments, you know. It's not easy, you know, for a farm boy, first of all, to find education. And secondly, he sort of say, meandered himself into Bell Labs, which was one of the best intellectual environments you can have. He also looked for fundamental problems. So when he was faced with the telegraph problem, he was sitting there. What is really the issue uh, to send signals fast? Uh, and then he catched the essence in abstract, uh, abstract ways, and he subtracted away the details, and he would sound use of, of mathematics. He wasn't as mathematically skilled as Bode. So for example, when he did the Nyquist theorem, he didn't use the, uh, the encirclement theorem, because he wasn't aware of complex variables. But whatever mathematics he, he knew, he was using it very effectively. Uh, I met his daughters. Uh, so here's what one of his daughters said of him. And I think you can read this by yourself. It has to do with hard working and doing problem solving. So I'll just be quiet and let you read about this. Ah, so, you know, it shows the importance also not only being smart, you also have to work hard. Uh, another thing was the importance of fundamentals. He solved specific engineering problems inspired by 1930s technology. And then he wrote a few concise papers with tremendous impact. So, for example, the Nyquist theorem. It's still up to date. 
Uh, and, and the reason why that is true is that he focused on the fundamental. He formulated clean problems and then he used good mathematics. So that's why his results have long lasting effects. He was also a very modest person. Uh, in Sweden, they have a register where they're interviewing all the, the emigrants. So when they're coming back and visit in Sweden, they emigrate. So here, and they always ask some standard question. My impressions and feelings as a stranger in the new country. And then he said, I don't think it was any different from what it would have been if I gone to Karlstad, was the nearest big city to where he was born, or to Stockholm. So no big deal. Distinctions I received. I received honors for technical work. <laughs> Literary works, books, etc. I published a few technical papers. Invention and discoveries, notable achievements. I've been granted a number of patents. The number is 128. <laughs> so here he is. He was born in 1889, and he lived until 1976. And, and in my mind, his most prominent things are the, the uh, theory for <coughs> thermal noise, the Nyquist frequency, and the stability criterion, and the fact that he was emphasizing fundamentals. Now, I should say a few words about Sardew. And I would like to thank you very much for the very nice interactions we have you know, at IFAC and also at many other occasions. Uh, we have also benefited tremendously to have an influx of Italian faculty and students to learn. Now we have two uh, full-time faculty from Italy. One is from Politecnico Milan. The other one made a detour over the United States. Um, you did a fantastic job when you did the, the, the World Congress in Milan. Uh, I had the pleasure of doing a sabbatical in Pavia. And, um, uh, I went to Milan, Milan several times, and Sergio was my guest there. So I think that was the time I really got to know him personally. And he was very kind to me, and they took me around. And um, he was also always showing me the place to find the right espresso at the right time. Uh, and also lately, we have had uh, a joint interest in history. So we've been discussing history at various instances of time. So I'm very happy to join your celebration. And I would like to wish you a happy retirement. And I consider myself a retirement veteran. You know, I retired the first time at the turn of the century. So judging from my experience, you are just now reaching a period of your life that's going to be fantastic. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you.